Hello, and thank you for attending the Vista Safety Consulting and IMA presentation of what to expect from OSHA in 2017. Note this is in February 2017 when this is being recorded. However, there are some expectations and some general history here that will be set. My name is Kyle Cochran and I'll be your speaker today. I am the Senior Vice President of Vista Safety Consulting. I have over 10 years of safety and loss control experience in both manufacturing, construction, and the insurance realm. So I'm able to bring a well-rounded base of knowledge to the manufacturing entities. So the current state of OSHA, where are we with things? Well, under the previous administration, we kind of took a step back in time. It's been a new OSHA, if you will, kind of like the way OSHA was originally designed to be. You know, the previous administration asked them to put the enforcement back into the Department of Labor with less focus on education and more on enforcement. The idea being, if we can actually have people do what they're supposed to be doing and we can kind of force, hence the enforcement part, force them to do that, we'll have a safer workforce. One of the ways OSHA plans to do this is through the Whistleblower Act. While this is not a new act, it's been around for quite some time, OSHA's really stepped up their enforcement of whistleblower violations. What the Whistleblower Act does is it allows employees or workers to file complaints to OSHA without fear of reprisal. They can contact OSHA via phone or online. Either way can be done anonymously and the employee has no fear of reprisal from their employer. As you can see from this slide, complaints have increased exponentially and there's no reason to think they're not going to keep going up. It makes documentation and procedures more important than ever. Another way that OSHA has tried to put the enforcement back into agency is by raising their penalties. Not only did they raise them, but they raised them approximately 78% as of August 1, 2016. This is quite the raise. What this means in a dollar and cents standpoint is that what used to be a serious or other than serious violation, which was most of your violations, those would have maxed out at $7,000 per occurrence. Now that goes up to over 12,000 per occurrence. Willful, which basically means you knew about it and chose not to do anything to fix it, or repeated, meaning that you've been cited for this before in the past five years, used to have a maximum of $70,000 per violation. And as you can see on this slide, that's gone up to over $124,000 per violation. Again, going back to the first slide, OSHA is wanting to put the enforcement back into the agency and this is one of the ways they're doing it. The feeling here is that inflation has gotten to such where OSHA citations didn't raise with inflation. Now they're doing a catch up. Now again, we've seen a lot. A lot of things have come out of OSHA in recent months. One of them being the severe injury and illness reporting. We'll get a little more in depth with this shortly. Another one being the hazard communication standard. Hopefully everyone's all compliant with this. This actually started back in 2012, but in 2016, full compliance is required now. We also have the silica standard, which lowers the exposure limits by half. Goes into effect June of 2017. The electronic reporting of injuries and illnesses started beginning of this year. We'll talk more about that on a later slide. We also had the walking working services, which went into effect last month. And finally, the beryllium standard lowers the exposure limits, goes into effect in March. So again, to backtrack a little more and make sure that we're clear about everything, the severe injury reporting that I alluded to in the previous slide. Any employer is required to notify OSHA within 24 hours anytime there is an enucleation, meaning someone loses an eye, they suffer an amputation with or without bone loss, that can be an area that's very confusing. Sometimes people will ask, they only lost part of a finger but no bone, is it an amputation? We'll get into that shortly as well. And also if the person is formally admitted to the hospital for treatment. We'll discuss a little in depth on a later slide what formally admitted actually means. And as always, you have to report any fatality to OSHA within eight hours of the occurrence. So even if this is something that happens on a second or third shift and the OSHA offices are still not open, we still need to call the hotline and leave a message, or more realistically, we need to do the online reporting of this within eight hours. So a lot of the questions we'll get are, I've reported an injury to OSHA. What happens now? What should I be expecting? 
will essentially know that these are triaged. Okay? OSHA looks at them from a triage standpoint. There's category one. These are the ones that will result in an on-site inspection. Obviously, this would be a fatality, or if you have a repeat offender, or maybe there's multiple injuries occurring from the same incident. The next category are things that may or are even likely to result in an on-site inspection. This could be something like confined space, lockout, tagout, if there's still an exposure or if there's been a complaint by an employee. Also if there's a local emphasis program, a strong likelihood that there could be an inspection here. Category 3 may not typically involve an on-site inspection. If it doesn't involve any of these aforementioned items, there's a good chance there will not be an on-site inspection. In the event that the area director decides not to conduct an on-site inspection, OSHA will then most likely initiate what's known as a rapid response investigation. In this situation, again, they will not be coming out on site, but they will expect some documentation and some follow-up from you explaining what has been done to keep this incident from happening again and what your corrective actions are. So moving on to the record keeping side of things a little bit, we're going to talk about both OSHA logs and the electronic reporting. So just a quick touch up on OSHA logs. This is not a new thing. OSHA logs have been around for a long time, but we always get a few questions about it. They apply to everyone on your payroll, not just hourly, not just salaried, but everyone on your payroll. Each case is recorded only one time. So if a person becomes injured and they miss time or they come back and they still feel things resulting from that one injury, it's still only recorded one time. There are some partial exemptions for who has to keep OSHA logs. Basically, any company with 10 or fewer employees or companies in lower hazard industries are exempt from keeping OSHA logs. However, know that in manufacturing, that's not a lower hazard industry. These are completely separate from workers' compensation. And what that means is there may be things that go on your OSHA logs that aren't claims or vice versa. The two are completely separate from one another. So what kind of things have to go on your OSHA log? What kind of things are to be recorded? Obviously, if there's a fatality, that's clearly a recordable injury. There's also days away from work. So if an employee becomes injured and has to miss work as a result of that injury, that's something that would have to be recorded. They may have to miss work due to direction from the employer or to direction from a medical professional. Either way, it still has to be recorded on the log. Anything that has a loss of consciousness, if an employee is knocked out even for a moment, loses conscious only for a moment, that is a recordable injury. Anything that comes down to restricted work, if an employee comes back to work on modified duties such as a lifting restriction, a sitting restriction, anything like this, it has to be recorded on the OSHA log. Also know a frequent question we get is how high do I count for an employee that's away from work or on restricted work? Know that there's a cap at 180 days. So if an employee is out of work for nine months or even longer, you still cap it at 180 days from that incident, from when it all started. Also, if say something started back in 2016 and the employee is still out now, that's recorded on the 2016 log, not on the 2017 log. Other items that could end up on your OSHA logs could be the diagnosis of a significant injury or illness, a job transfer, a permanent job transfer, such as an employee can't do the job they used to do due to an injury, you'll stop the count on days missed, but the job transfer still has to be recorded. There's also medical treatment beyond first aid. There are several ways treatment can be beyond first aid or can stay within first aid. Please feel free to reach out, for me, reach out to me for more information on this. And as I said earlier, if the injury occurred in 2016, it stays on 2016's OSHA log. You don't have to move it over to 2017 logs. Now, as it's February, one of the things we have to do is make sure that the OSHA 300A is posted on our facility. Employers are required to post this from February 1st to April 30th of each year, and it has to be posted somewhere conspicuous for employees to see. Typically, this is somewhere like a break room, a lunch room, near a time clock, something to this effect. It only has to be posted during this time, but has to be kept for five years and has to be available during that time as well. As said before, those OSHA 300 logs and 300A summary forms must be kept on file for five years. Even though they're not necessarily posted during all that time, they still have to be kept. If a privacy log was created, the same rules apply for that. There are certain injuries that could require a privacy log to be created. <clears throat> 
Now, one of the big things that's happening is the electronic reporting of injuries and illnesses. Information from your OSHA logs have to be submitted on a secure website and they will then be made public information. This means insurance companies, competitors, anybody can view them. The website is scheduled to go live in February 2017. As of this recording, it had not yet gone live. To quote OSHA, we believe that the possibility of public reporting of serious injuries will encourage, or in the behavioral economics term, nudge, employers to take steps to prevent injuries so they're not seen as unsafe places to work. Or in other words, the hope is they're going to push or embarrass companies into being more careful, more safe, and knowing that their injury data is going to be reported. So now who has to do this? Companies with 250 or more employees must electronically submit information from their OSHA Form 300, their 300A summary, and the 301, which is the Injury and Illness Incident Report. Smaller establishments with between 20 to 249 employees that are classified in certain industries must electronically submit forms from their OSHA Form 300A. That summary we discussed in the last slide. Note that manufacturing is included in the certain industries. So if you're 20 or more employees, you're going to have to submit data. This slide will reiterate what has to be submitted via the secure website. Find whether you're more than 250 employees or you're between that 20 to 249 employees and it will show you what forms have to be submitted and the dates at which they are due. Now there were other items that came in as part of this electronic record keeping provision. One of them being the anti-retaliation provisions and there's a lot to this. It became effective December 1st, 2016. It was originally scheduled to begin in August 2016, then pushed back to November 1st and ultimately went into place December 1st, 2016. The anti-retaliation rule has two goals. One, obviously with the name to discourage retaliation and two, to encourage workplace illness and injury reporting. One of the parts of the anti-retaliation provision is on incentive programs. For quite some time, OSHA has had an issue with incentive programs, but they've never actually taken a steadfast ruling. That changed with this. They've stated that incentive programs are prohibited under the Occupational Safety and Health Act if they deter or discourage employees from reporting injuries by denying a benefit to the employees. Basically, what this means is if there's a prize associated with there not being an injury for a certain amount of time or not being a lost time in a certain amount of time and the employees then get a prize or entered in a drawing or anything to that effect, this is now a no-go per OSHA. However, if it's structured in such a way that it encourages safety, such as employees bringing up safety concerns or having safety audits with no findings, these would be allowed. Basically, the idea behind the whole thing is that if it's tied to injuries and an employee might be inclined to hide or even pressured to hide an injury so that that employee or other employees wouldn't lose their prize, that's a no-go. A second part of the provision is that for incident reporting. It's on the employer to establish reasonable procedures for employees to report work-related injuries and illnesses promptly and accurately. Obviously, with the Whistleblower Act, we have to ensure that employees are not retaliated against for reporting work-related injuries, even if there is no complaint or whistleblower. <clears throat> Obviously, we have to ensure that employees are not retaliated against for reporting work-related injuries, even if there was no whistleblower complaint filed. As discipline is an important part and an important cornerstone of any safety program, you must ensure that your discipline programs are clearly communicated and always, always, always discipline consistently. Some of the things we've seen coming out of OSHA of recent is obviously there's an expectation for written programs, there's an expectation for training, there's an expectation for job site inspections, and also one for discipline. The idea being that if we find things, such as a person not wearing their appropriate safety equipment, they may be subject to discipline because, again, sometimes enforcement is the job of the employer, not just training. The employer is required to inform employees of their right to report such an injury or illness. 
free retaliation. Posting the OSHA workers' right poster from April 2015 or later will satisfy this obligation. It looks like the one on your slide right now. Take a look at your OSHA poster and if it doesn't have this section, it can be downloaded from the OSHA website or purchased if you'd like a bigger one. Another big provision to come out of the anti-retaliation provisions is one on drug testing. This one's gotten a lot of play recently. Basically, in short, in order for there to be a post-incident drug test, it's got to be at least likely that the employee being under the influence could have contributed to the incident and also that the drug test can accurately identify impairment by the drug use. The final rule does not prohibit employers from using drug testing as a form of adverse action against employees who report injuries or illness. What's important to understand here is it has to be something that could have been caused by impairment. For instance, if an employee were stung by a bee or lifting as part of their normal job function, this would be something tough to say as cause for a drug test, as the employee was doing what they were supposed to be doing, and that could be viewed as a threat. OSHA is trying to make sure that testing is not used to punish those who report injuries or illnesses, because again, part of this is to make sure that injuries and illnesses are reported. Employers may conduct post-incident drug testing pursuant to state or federal law, including workers' compensation drug-free workplace policies. Employers may also conduct post-incident drug testing pursuant to DOT regulations. So the central question to ask anytime you have an incident and you're considering post-incident drug testing, is there a reasonable basis to think that the injury could have been caused or at least contributed to by the employee being under the influence? And also, can the drug test provide insight into why the injury or illness occurred? And then whether or not the drug test is capable of measuring impairment at the time of the injury or illness, will we know how much was in their system and how it affected them? So when it comes to post-incident drug testing and you're trying to decide whether or not you should conduct it for an incident, one of the big keys is always document your decisions. Document why you did or why you didn't conduct a post-incident drug test. For further guidance, both the links on your slides will take you to some of the OSHA record-keeping rules and will give you some more guidance on whether or not you should and some of the rules that go into place with it. So there's a lot to these provisions. What do we do now? Review your safety manuals, employee handbook, collective bargaining agreements, or other policies. Review them now. Don't wait for an incident to happen and scramble. Post the new OSHA poster, ensure you have that up. Consult your insurance broker or carrier to review your drug testing requirements. And also consult with your safety consultant or attorney as to your next steps on what you should do. Be clear and consistent. Don't be confused. Don't have to think of it once the incident happens. Know your path and follow your path. Another new standard that came out is that in, on silica. This applies to those of you that work in the concrete industries, or even those of you that have concrete on your floors and may have construction going on, there could be an exposure to silica. There is two different standards, one for construction and one for general industry. General industry will be the one that will apply here. Basically, the long and short of it is that OSHA has reduced the exposure limit for crystalline silica approximately 50%. So what used to be allowed over the course of a day has been cut in half over the course of a day. It also includes requirements for compliance methods, exposure monitoring, training, and medical surveillance to employees who may be exposed. If you have further questions on silica, please feel free to reach out. Another standard that recently made its way into law is the Walking Working Surfaces Standard. This one had been kicked around OSHA for several years and finally made its way in early 2017. It's a focus on falls in general industry primarily related to falls from height, falls from the same level, and personal protection. One of the goals of this standard is to identify and evaluate slip, trip, and fall hazards and provide appropriate personal protection. One of the goals is to conduct regular and periodic inspections and maintenance of all walking and working surfaces in the workplace. It also updates scaffolding requirements as they apply to general industry. Another goal is also to ensure workers who use personal fall protection and work in other high hazard situations are trained to recognize the hazards of falling and the procedures to be followed. 
This standard and frequently asked questions can be found on the link that's on your screen right now. So we've talked a lot about things that have happened, most of them under the former President Obama administration. What does this mean for now and the future? What does the future hold? President Trump had nominated Secretary of Labor, Andrew Pudser. As of this recording, that no longer stood. But where this is still important is that Mr. Pudser had been an outspoken critic of what he considered to be excessive government regulation of businesses. And it's not an outlier to think that President Trump won't go the same route with his next nomination. President Trump also released a statement saying that Mr. Pudser would fight to make American workers safer and more prosperous by enforcing fair occupational safety standards and ensuring workers receive the benefits they deserve. This is interesting. Will there be more regulation, as that bottom statement may suggest, or will there be less, as that top statement say, may suggest? We can't be sure, completely sure yet. So, some of the predictions, some of the things that we in the safety world think may happen. Well, we anticipate there will be a number of standards and regulations that will be reviewed within the first six months of President Trump's administration. There could also be increased funding for strategic partnerships and alliances, removal of many pending items on the regulatory agenda, of which there are many, resurgence of the VPP and SHARP protective programs, and that most inspections will be event-driven, meaning they happened as a result of an incident or of a complaint. There will also probably be a hard look at national emphasis programs and potentially even a revamp or a repeal. This wouldn't be the first time such an event has happened. When President Clinton was on his way out of office in 2000, the ergonomic standards were passed. Within weeks of being in office, President George W. Bush repealed these standards. So we've covered a lot here today. A lot of things that are currently law, whether or not they stick will remain to be seen, but as of right now, they are law, they are part of OSHA, they are past standards. That said, should you have any questions, comments, or need any assistance, please feel free to reach out. My contact information is on the screen. And again, my name is Kyle Cochran with Vista Safety Consulting. Thank you.